It's uh, good to have you with us uh, this morning. Uh, if I don't know you, my name is Brian. I am the uh, lead pastor here at uh, Grace City, and so it's a real honor to have you uh, in our space uh, this morning. Our, our church just came out of a series uh, looking at prayer. It was a really uh, important series for our church, and, and, and really what we talked about over the last, gosh, the last few months or so uh, is really our desire to become a uh, praying church. And and kind of looking at 2024, simply saying, we're going to be a type of church that uh, prays. And so one of the things that I I think um, coming out of that particular series that I want to be really sensitive of um, is if you were there for that and you can kind of hear it, um, there's a chance in which you could could hear that kind of message and think, okay, um, we just want to be a church that, that is highly kind of inward focus. So when, when we say we want to be a praying church, that that means that we, we want to just kind of like turn inward and uh, we, we want to, you know, pray to God and, and we want to make sure that, you know, we're healthy and he knows how much we love him and we understand how much uh, he loves us. Like you, like if you're, if you kind of not hearing properly out of that series, you could get that kind of uh, understanding of like, oh, well, Grace City doesn't really they're not outward focused. They're more just kind of inward focus, and they're going to focus on uh, devotion in 2024. Uh, and that's, that's actually not the case at all. Uh, we, we don't want to be a church. We, we didn't start our church uh, just to kind of gather some people so that at some point we could kind of just turn inward and work on our devotion to God and just kind of grow in maturity together um, in the city of Boston. Uh, we actually planted our church, and, and the reason that we've actually said that we want to be a praying church um, is because we feel desperate uh, to reach our lost friends and neighbors and our spouses and our children. Uh, it's actually the, the lostness of the city that drives us to prayer. It's not simply out of a desire to have a devotion to the Lord and grow in maturity and experience uh, a type of, um, you know, inward type of serenity or whatever. Uh, it's actually the lostness that we experience around us uh, that drives us to prayer. And, and so what I want to look at this morning is I want to look at one, uh, one passage in particular that uh, I think kind of w- will lay this out helpful uh, in a helpful way. It comes from Acts chapter 17. And so if you have a Bible, uh, you can go ahead and turn there, Acts 17. We're going to start in verse 16. And we're going to look at Paul's interaction um, in Athens. Uh, I think this will be a nice kind of uh, balancing act. And so what, what we're going to do is we closed out our prayer series last week. Uh, we've got kind of a, um, a, a kind of a one standalone uh, sermon for uh, this morning for this Sunday, and then next week we're going to start into a series uh, that we've entitled Holy Week. And so for the next uh, few weeks, working all the way up to Easter, we're going to be looking at the last week of Jesus' life, so that when we get to Easter, we're kind of fully prepared or we're fully kind of understanding what's been going on and happening in the last week of Jesus' life. But I want to look at Acts 17. Uh, first this morning. Uh, We'll start in verse 16. Here's the kind of the three guiding questions for us this morning. Uh, They'll be on the screen as well so you can see them. Uh, This is just surrounded with Paul. Uh, I want to look at where does he go, what does he do, and how do they respond? So where does Paul go in Acts 17? Uh, What does he do when he gets to this particular location, and how do they respond when he gets there? Now, but before we get into this, I just want to uh, make just a comment or a word on personal ministry. Uh, so everyone here uh, has a personal ministry. Uh, now, that may sound like a very kind of churchy word to you or like a silly word to you, but, but basically it just means um, ministry is not just something that pastors do or people that are on staff at a church. Um, every person that considers himself a follower of Jesus has a personal ministry. Like God has called you to a unique place with a unique skill set, uh, with a unique people to minister to them, to share the gospel to them, to show love to them, to, to practice your gifts in a way that would um, be stewarded well and that would help them. And, and so all of us, because I, I want to weave this idea of personal ministry, this unique ministry uh, that each of us have, I kind of want to weave this into Acts 17 um, as, we, as we progress. And so I just want you thinking this morning as we're getting into it, okay, what is my personal ministry? Where does God uniquely place me? Uh, in what ways can I share that other people may not be able to? Okay, first question, where does uh, Paul go? Acts 17 
uh, 16 and 17. And so the Apostle Paul, he, he was a, an early persecutor of the church who then becomes a, a follower of Jesus. So he was Saul. When we first meet him, his name is Saul. Uh, he has a radical encounter with Jesus, and that radical encounter with Jesus changes him because that's what radical encounters with Jesus do. And so he has this radical encounter. Uh, Jesus uh, totally uh, wrecks his life, changes his name. His name becomes Paul. And he becomes one of the early leaders of the New Testament uh, church. And so they're going around. He and a couple of other leaders, men and women, are going around planting various churches. And so they're sharing the gospel, building up these communities, and then going into other cities. This is what's happening all throughout the book of Acts, all throughout the known world in this particular uh, place. So Acts 17, 16, and 17. Let me pray for us, then we'll dive into it. Father, thank you that you give us your scriptures. May we um, use it in a way this morning that would honor you. Uh, Father, would you uh, help us just to settle in this morning? God, I pray uh, your spirit um, would just enter into this space and and bring about insight and clarity and conviction, whatever particular thing that we need this morning from your scripture. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just work alongside of that, God. And so we need your help. There, there's so many of these things that we fight against, that we rally against. Uh, Father, but we want to grow in conformity to Jesus. Uh, we want to understand what it means to follow in the way of Christ. And so would you help us? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, Acts 17, 16 through 17, it says this. Uh, While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw the city was full of idols. Verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Okay, so if we're looking at this text in 16 and 17, where does it say that Paul goes? Where where does it say that he goes in this particular story? Well, it says that he goes to the temple, which was pretty normal. He would go into the temple. He would debate with the religious kind of uh, temple leaders of the day. He would say, hey, these uh, Old Testament prophecies, prophecies that you've been reading, they're actually pointing to Jesus. So this is what he would do in the temple. It was pretty effective uh, a lot of the time. But it also says that uh, he goes also into the marketplace. Now, the marketplace was actually the place where most people spend their time. Now, it, it's interesting because you're like, okay, well, um, who exactly was in the marketplace? Well, everybody was in the marketplace because you have to realize at this point uh, in time, there's no technology. So if you were going to interact with people, um, you were going to go and do it in the marketplace. So at this particular time, you would have had town officials and judges, they would have been deliberating in the marketplace. You would have had uh, artists would have been creating in the marketplace. This would have been uh, their kind of stock market-like type of place. You would have uh, businessmen who would be making deals at this particular place. Uh, This is where you would have media would be in the marketplace because they didn't have newspapers, right? And so if you were going to hear about what was going on, you would have to hear it face-to-face with those who would be in the marketplace. You would have philosophers that would be uh, debating in the marketplace. And so as you can imagine, the marketplace was this kind of bustling place where there's all of these exciting things uh, that would be happening in this moment. There's probably most likely only three marketplaces like this in the whole Greco-Roman world. There would have been one in Rome, one in Athens, and one in Alexandria. And so Paul goes to the temple, and then he leaves the temple, and he goes into the marketplace. And it's fascinating because he comes into Athens— and Paul's like, let me get into the marketplace. He, he goes and does the temple thing. But then he's like, where are all the people at? Because I want to be where all the people are. So let, let me get into this particular space where all of uh, the energy is. Now, when a lot of people think about religion and faith, they think about it just in terms of what? That faith is something that just brings inner peace. This is what they think. When they think about religion, maybe it's people that you interact with that aren't followers of Jesus. They think about your faith. They're like, man, your faith is great. It kind of brings you like this, this peace inside of you. And that's really fantastic. And, and that's a really awesome thing. And so for them, faith is uh, private. It is uh, personal. Maybe you felt that way. My faith is just this private and it's this personal thing. Well, what Paul is showing us here, and I think it's very informative, Uh, Paul is actually showing us that faith isn't private and it isn't personal. 
that, that it's actually the quite opposite of, of, of that. This idea that faith is private and personal is actually opposite of the gospel teaching. It's the opposite of the Great Commission that Jesus gives at the end of Matthew uh, 28. Our, our faith isn't something that we simply uh, keep to ourselves. It's not a uh, privatized type of thing. Now, secularism as a system hates this idea. There are all kinds of different like, definitions for what secularism is. I, I just want to talk about secularism as a system, uh, a way that the world works, right, for a moment. Um, the goal of secularism, I want you to hear this, it's very important. The goal of secularism is to privatize your faith. So what the world system wants you to do is to take your faith, they just want to simply say, that's really great, I love that you have that, I think that's fantastic, if it brings you inner peace, that's really awesome, you need to keep that to yourself. So take whatever faith you got and put it in your pocket. Don't pull that out. We don't need to hear about it. Don't share it with us. Like kind of do your thing in your own personal space, but do not bring that into the public sector. Do you, do you realize like that is, that secularism is built to privatize our faith, to keep it as this thing uh, off to the side. And, and so Paul, what, what we see in this particular moment um, is, is Paul is like, uh, Paul's like, where are the people? Let me get into the public sec sector. Let me get into the marketplace. L let me kind of share uh, what, what's going on. It's reminiscent of uh, Proverbs 1, 20 through 21 in talking about uh, wisdom in, in walking in the way of God. It says, uh, the, the writer says this. It says, wisdom calls out in the street. She makes her voice heard in the public squares. She cries out above the commotion. She speaks at the entrance of the city gates. Doesn't sound like a privatized faith. It sounds like a faith that's meant to be communicated to our friends and our coworkers, our spouses, our kids. It's not, a, it's not about a, achieving an inner peace. It's about communicating a truth and a reality. Okay, so the first thing he does, where does he go? He goes to the public, the marketplace. Second thing is, what does he do when he's there? What does he do? Well, two of the things that we know, let's state the negative and then we'll state the positive. Uh, the first thing that he does, or the, really the first two things stated in the negative, is he doesn't allow himself to become dismayed or distracted. So he doesn't allow himself to both to either become dismayed, and we'll talk about that in a second, or distracted as an individual. So Acts 17, verse 16, look what it says. It says, Paul, uh, while Paul was, what was Paul doing in Athens? It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens. So, so Paul... Why, why would he be dismayed, right? Why, why would he have a, a posture of potentially being dismayed? Well, Athens was, wasn't actually a part of Paul's plan. He, he wasn't going there. Um, this is actually a really fantastic lesson on being present and being faithful where God places you. It, it's interesting. So um, Paul finds himself in Athens uh, because he's been ran out of Berea. It's, it's really interesting. Um, so th this is kind of what we learned from, from Paul. Because I, the reason I think this is important is because I think there are a lot of us in the room who've allowed dissatisfaction with where you are in life to paralyze you. And, and you've basically allowed a, a spirit of bitterness to grow. You, you've allowed, um, perhaps you've gotten angry with God because you said, this, is, this wasn't my plan. Uh, I thought that I would be further along in my career. Uh, I thought my relationship status would be different. I thought my marriage would be different. I thought my bank account would be different than what it looks like. The, the degree is taking longer. And, and, and there's a lot of people that allow, because of where they're at and their kind of current status in life, they've either gotten bitter or they've gotten angry with God. And that discontentment, that sense of feeling dismayed has paralyzed them. And it stopped them from living in the way of Jesus, from leveraging and stewarding their particular moment in time. We've talked about personal ministry, right? It's stopping their personal ministry from going forward. 
And maybe you're like, you don't understand, but, you know, Paul doesn't really understand. Well, what do we learn from Paul? Uh, what does he do? Because he could have easily gotten frustrated. Um, so Paul was in Berea, in, a little bit before this. He's in Berea, and he's experiencing incredibly successful ministry. So Acts 17, 11 through 12, look what's happening right before he gets uh, into Athens. It says, they received, the Bereans received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Verse 12, consequently, many of them believed, including a number of the prominent Greek women as well as men. So, so Paul is in, so it says, many of them believed, these prominent men and women, these Greek men and women. And so this thing is beginning to take off. So, so Paul's in Berea, and he's like, he's sharing the gospel. He didn't have success in uh, Thessalonica, which was right before this, because he gets pushed out by some jealous Jews. And so now they're in Berea. He's sharing the gospel, and he's seeing success in a really difficult environment, in a really difficult place. And so you've got to think that Paul is thinking, all right, it's happening. Like this thing's happening. The Great Commission, the, it, it's happening. What Jesus has been seeing us out to do, we're beginning to see it. Like we're seeing success now in Berea. Whew, Thessalonica was difficult, was hard. Uh, kind of glad to be out of there. You know, uh, we're, at, we're out of there, but now we're in Berea. Now this thing is growing. Now this thing is, is we're picking up momentum. And how, how good of the Father to give us ministry success in Berea. And, and, and what happens, it's fascinating, is that the, 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 the Jews who were jealous of what Paul was doing in Thessalonica and his, the leadership with him follow him to Berea. And then what happens, in the middle of successful ministry, they run him out of town. They start a riot and run him out of town. So I want you to think about this for a second. This is what I mean by Paul didn't allow himself to be dismayed. He was in the throes of success in his mind. He's experiencing the favor of God in Berea. And what happens? He gets pushed out. And he finds himself now in Athens, where he was never anticipating being. And now he's finding himself back at the bottom you know the story about the guy who rolls the, the rock up the hill, right? And he gets it to the top of the hill. Uh, it's just like, you know, Greek, stoic kind of uh, story, right? He rolls it up to the hill, and then it rolls back on him. That's what I feel like as a preacher every Sunday. And so, um, right, <laughs> I get my sermon to the top. It's like it rolls back on me uh, Monday morning. All right, so um, Paul's back at the bottom of the hill. And he could have got to Athens. You know what he could have done in Athens? He could have said, God, what are you doing? Why did you bring me here? Did you not see what I was doing for you over there? Man, that thing was taken off. We're about to roll up. We're starting a building campaign. Like, what's happening? What's happening? He could have allowed himself to be dismayed, and yet he doesn't. He doesn't get dismayed. But he also shows us that he doesn't get distracted. Acts 17, 22 and 23, it says this. It says, uh, Paul stood in the middle of the Aragopagus and said, <clears throat> people of Athens, exclamation mark, uh, they didn't have punctuation in Greek, but whatever. Uh, I see that you're extremely religious in every respect. Verse 23, now look what he says here. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which it is inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So, so Paul's plans are totally changed. And yet he's doing what? So he's not sitting and kind of wallowing in the sadness and in the bitterness. It says that he's walking around Athens and doing what? What is he doing? Observing. He's checking out the city. He's looking around. He's like, oh man, I'm seeing idols in these uh, kind of various places, these places of worship. And, and I think a lot of what God is calling us back to is, is just simply what I would call attentive evangelism. And we've become a people so distracted that, that I think our, the, the personal ministry opportunities we would have if we would simply look up would greatly increase. And we become a people um, so distracted by uh, technology, we've been distracted by social media, materialism, just, we've just kind of adopted a general posture of consumption 
that the amount of ministry kind of opportunities that we may run into in our day is simply missed because we're just not looking up. And I think God is calling us back to being a people of attentive type of evangelism where we stop looking at our phone, we stop reading the thing, you know, we, we just kind of stop doing those things that we get obsessed with and we just start looking up around us. And the amount of opportunities, if we just look people in the face, right? Now, I'm not telling like stare people in the eye on the train because that will freak them out. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm an aide on the Enneagram, so sometimes I just stare, stare at people in the eye. I just want to see if I can make eye contact on the train. Um, we, we've just become a people that are just so distracted that we just, we just miss. Like, God can't use you if you're distracted with lots of other things. And, and Paul gives us a, a lesson here when he's in, he's in Athens. He gives us kind of a, 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 a rhythm here of saying, like, he, he just looks up. He's not distracted by pop culture or tech or politics or sports or finances. Like Paul is so consumed with the story of Jesus. He's like, get me into the marketplace. Get me into Athens. Let me, let me see how they're operating. Let me try and like digest, kind of take all of this in. And let me figure out how to apply the gospel correctly based on what they have going on. So he says, I see that you have many idols in this city i'm recognizing that you are a religious people and, and it's not that um it's not that he's just consumed with jesus i, I think that paul has a healthy what, what i call a healthy theology of space and time and and what i mean what i mean by that is it it um what paul wants to always do is align himself with the sovereignty of god he actually references this in his speech Acts 17 26 and 27 uh, look what he says here. It's one of my favorite texts. He says, from uh, one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth. So he's like, okay, a whole nationality, a, a, a people group are living on the whole earth. And then look what he says about this people group. He says, this, this, this over the whole earth has determined the appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. So, so what does that mean, that he has determined the appointed times and boundaries of where they live. What that means is the fact that you are alive and in Boston at this moment is not an accident. God is sovereign. And he has you here in this moment for a reason. And you can be dismayed and you can be distracted and you can miss the work that God is trying to do through you. But you being here in this moment is not an accident and so maybe you thought your degree brought you here maybe you thought a job opportunity brought you here maybe you thought a relationship brought you here whatever right whatever particular thing brought you to the city or maybe you've been in the city your whole life you are not here by accident and, and paul has a healthy theology of space and time and then look what he says he says the reason that we're defined in these places verse 27 it says he did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each of this. And so God has allotted our time to be here. He's determined our boundary times, our, our boundary uh, lines and our appointed times. And so our responsibility is to not allow ourselves to become distracted or dismayed. And, and, and honestly, if, if we're going to do this right, if we're going to do the Christian journey right, we not only have to understand having a healthy kind of theology of space and time, but we have to accept it. We have to quit walking in bitterness and anger. And, and some of you, your prayers are, are simply, like all of your prayers, I'll, I'll say this in the most loving way I know how to say it. And, and God knows the desires of your heart. Like he hears the desires of your heart. But your, your prayers to God are just simply, just simply filled with, God, I thought you were going to. And you've got so many God, I thought you were going to stuff that you're, you're missing God's um, ability to be able to use you right now and what he wants to do with you. And what I'm asking of you is to look up, to not get dismayed, not get distracted, recognize there's a real enemy on the loose, 
and that your coworkers and friendship, like I know things haven't lined up the way that you want, but you have coworkers and friends that are going to spend eternity not in the presence of a loving God. And it is your responsibility and my responsibility to share the good news with them. That there's a God in heaven who loves them. And I'm begging you to look up. This is the, the gift that Paul gives us. Okay, so he doesn't get dismayed. He doesn't get distracted. What does he do? What does he do? A few things here. Uh, the first thing that he does is he's broken over the lostness of the city. Acts 17, 16. It says, while he was waiting in Athens, he's what? Deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. What is Paul's attitude to the lostness of the city that is going around him? Is Paul indifferent? Is he indifferent? No. No. It, it, he doesn't just simply go, oh, no big deal to each his own. Like, your truth is your truth. You know, you do you, right? Paul didn't think, well, I don't want to create issues. You know, if I start to, like, start, if I go to the marketplace and start sharing the way of Jesus, I'm going to create, like, issues in this moment. Was that his attitude? Was he indifferent to kind of the issue around us? No, no, it says that he is deeply distressed by what he sees in the city. That it's full of idols, and some of you need to pray to God that he would give you a spirit of brokenness over the city of Boston. Because some of you just walk like it's no big deal and like everything's cool and people just kind of do their thing and people live their truth or whatever. And you feel zero distress over the lostness of your friends. And you're like, man, boys will be boys, girls will be girls. It's the time of their life, whatever, whatever. So some of you need to have a, an Isaiah 6 moment. Isaiah 6, 3, he says what? He says, woe is me for I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah goes, woe is me because of my sin. And then he says, woe is me because I live among a sinful people. And I think we need to adopt the attitude of Paul and go, God, would you break my heart for the lostness that I see around me? Would you do it? Would you give it to me? And so maybe that's just, that's all you need this morning is to ask that God would open your eyes to ensure that you're not getting distracted, that you would embrace your unique placement in time, that God would give you that burden. The second thing that he does, he affirms what he can. It's Acts 17, 22. It says, Paul stood in the middle of the Aragopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that you're extremely religious in every respect. For I was passing through observing your objects of worship I even found an altar which is inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, you worship what you worship in ignorance, I proclaim to you. Look what he does there. Paul does what? He doesn't just simply move in being distressed. He, he does what? He's trying to build bridges with his audience. He's trying to affirm what he can. He's like looking up and going, man, this is like you guys are pretty religious. I think that's awesome. You, you guys have, you, you, you seem to be in tune with, with the, the little G gods, right? He, he's trying to uh, affirm that. He's not just simply uh, condemning them. He's finding what is commendable, what is good and right. He's like, man, this is great. He even quotes their own poets. Uh, Acts 17, 28 says, for in him we live and move and have our being as even, look what he says here, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also, for we are also his offspring. So, so Paul knew, he knew the Stoic and the Epicurean uh, philosophies of the day, right? He's quoting their poets. To, to show that what was previously an unknown God, this is what he's talking about here, they have this one unknown God. He says, what's previously this unknown God is actually a true God who we uh, live and move and have our being. And then, then he says, like your poets have only said, we are his offspring, right? What, what is he doing? He's demonstrating a, a type of intellectual credibility to them. He's saying, I, I, I get it. I'm, I'm challenged. He's challenging the audience to, to see God, right? The, to, to proclaim the God that they're, they've been worshiping all along in, uh, among a plurality of gods. And so you say, man, th this, is, this is good. Now, when I talk about um, not being distracted, what I don't mean is not being attuned to the culture. I, I don't mean just like totally shutting off uh, to the culture. Like I, I purposely have subscriptions that I keep that just kind of help me uh, stay in line uh, with the culture, right? So I have a New York Times subscription and I, I will read it. Typically, things come through there before they get to the rest of 
you know, the world. And so if there's an, an interesting article pop up, uh, I'll read it. I'll just kind of read it just so I have a, an idea of what's happening. Uh, the, my other gift is I have a 12 year old daughter. So I know what, you know, sus is. I know what, um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I, you know, I'm learning all the terms, right, that, that have now risen to the surface. I'm, I have found myself at that point in my life. And so, uh, you know, we, she kind of helps keep me, like, updated on, on what's happening and what's kind of going on at an appropriate level in the culture, at a 12-year-old level in the culture, right? Like, I, I, it's not that I just totally uh, kind of shut off. I have a People Magazine subscription. I'm just kidding. I don't. All right, so, um, but I did when I was younger. All right, so, uh, <clears throat> I, we, I, it, it's not that I'm asking you to not be attuned to what's going on in the cultural moment. Um, that's, that's not. I, I, I have newsletters that I get that summarize things for me that are, that are helpful, um, that, uh, that, that are just help me stay attuned to the culture. This is what Paul's doing. He's, he's trying to affirm what he can and, and understand what is happening and, and what is going on in that moment. Finally, what does he do? So, so he doesn't get distracted. He doesn't get dismayed. He affirms what he can, um, he, or he's moved uh, to the lostness of the city. He affirms what he can. And then thirdly, he confronts and corrects their idolatry. Uh, Athens was one of the greatest cities in the ancient world. It was the center for intellectual and cultural achievement. And you had uh, some of the greatest philosophers of the day. You had so- um, Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, Socrates. They all lived there. Athens was producing many kind of famous playwrights. And if you were going to walk through the marketplace, right, you would see a, a, a plurality of idols at this particular moment. And it's indicative of the Athenians' kind of religious devotion uh, that they would have. And so you would find temples of worship for Roman Caesars, uh, for Greek and Roman gods. You would find countless other shrines and idols. Uh, one novelist at the time wrote of Athens, is a city of roughly 25,000 people. It is easier to meet a god in the street than a human. And Paul finds himself among this idolatry. Acts 17, 24, look what he does here. It says, the God who made the world and everything in it, he's the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. Since then, we are God's offspring. We shouldn't think that divine nature is like God or like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art or imagination. So he says, listen, I see all this stuff. God doesn't live in these shrines. He doesn't live. He's not a God who's made of wood and gold and still. These things, he's like, these things aren't going to do it. A living God's not here in these places. And then he moves on. So now he's going to confront and correct. Verse 30, He says, therefore, since God is not living in these things, what are we to do with it? Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to what? Repent. Because he has set a day when he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Paul says, Christ is alive. He's the Messiah, he's the Lord. He's been risen from the grave and he will come back. And in the time at which God was practicing a type of patience, he says that time is over. And if you do not turn from your idolatry, you will pay for it. God is loving and he's kind, but he's also just. And so he says, you turn from these idols. You turn from these empty ways. We, we, we've got to be comfortable. We've got to be a people that are comfortable with saying, man, that, I, that lifestyle you're living, dude, is not go- it's actually not going to produce life. If you follow that to the end, that produces death. If you chase after um, wealth and affluence, it is not going to produce what you thought. You're going to sacrifice to that thing and it's going to take your life. Like, like it's not going to work, that, that position, what, whatever, whatever it is. We got to be comfortable with saying, hey, that thing's not going to do it. So Paul confronts them. He says, man, I, I need you to um, turn. I think 
we've talked about this before, but I think many times we care more about our public image than we do about someone's eternity. And I think we're more interested in protecting our public image than we are about communicating to a lost person the good news of the gospel. And we've got to begin to, to turn on this and allow people to see flourishing uh, with Jesus. This is what he does. What does our Athens look like? I just want to uh, quickly move through this. Leslie Newbegin, um, he uh, was a missionary, considered uh, probably the top kind of modern missionary of our day. And uh, he wrote a book called Foolishness to the Greeks. And he basically poses this question that's helpful as we think about reaching our Athens. He says this, what would be involved in a missionary encounter between the gospel and this whole world. Now, he says three things here that he addresses. Perceiving, thinking, and living. So he says, how does our world perceive or see? How does our world think, and how does our world live? Paul uh, Goad, he wrote a book called Cultural Apologetics. I would commend it to you. It's the best book that I've read on reaching the modern world in our kind of current cultural moment. And, and Paul Gold says three things about our particular world that we operate in that I think will be helpful. They'll be on the screen. He says this. He says, how does our culture perceive the world? He says, our culture is disenchanted. So he says that the view of the world presented to us in the Bible is sacred and beautiful, yet our culture treats it as mundane, ordinary, and familiar. That our culture is under the spell of materialism. And so the problem that we have, the way that we perceive the world is we're disenchanted. Like, ah, oh, it's just, the world's ordinary. What you see is what you get. What about how do we uh, think? Well, he says the way that we think about the world is we're sensate. So we're fixed on the physical or the sensory or the material. It's, it's like what uh, C.S. Lewis says in the screw tape letters. He says that we're focused on a stream of experience with little attention to universal matters. We have a whole education system that trains us to fix our minds upon the material world. We become fixated on the here and now with little thought for what is after this. And the collective mind is largely anti-intellectual, it's shallow, it's lacking the intellectual categories or ability to think deeply about the things that matter most. We're just like, all this in the world is this, this physical thing. This is how we think about the world. So that's a problem. Uh, Thirdly, how do we live in the world? He says, the way that we live in the world is we're hedonistic. We move from one pleasure to the next, filling ourselves with bite-sized bite -sized pleasures that give an immediate sensual playoff, uh, payoff but end up enslaving us. And so we have a strong and good desire to advance justice, to protect the poor and oppressed, to meet the needs of all people, but then our desire ultimately falls short because we have a disenchanted view of reality and we have embraced the corresponding doctrines of materialism, hedonism, and Unitarianism. The Christian virtues of faith, hope, and love have been replaced by the modern virtues of tolerance, personal autonomy, and progressivism. He says most of the things that the people try to experience in this world, he calls them spiritual pornography that actually don't fill on what they promise they fill on. And so he says the, the thing that, that, that we should be pointing to, right, for people, is that we should help people understand that truth, beauty, and goodness comes through the gospel. That you want truth, right? Uh, this um, uh, truth kind of answers this idea of this, uh, this like first idea that really all that exists is like here, the, the here and now. Um, he says beauty is where you, you actually experience flourishing um, in life and, and goodness is actually the opposite of hedonism. You want to live a good life that comes through the gospel. All right, third thing, how do they respond? Uh, verse 18 of Acts uh, 17, this is 18 and 21. It says, Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him, and some said, What is this ignorant show off trying to say? So I'm loving what he's saying. I'm loving what he's saying here. It says, Others replied, He seemed to be a preacher of foreign deities because he's telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. It says, They took him and they brought him to the Areopagus and said to him, uh, May we learn about this new teaching that you're presenting? 
Verse 20, I love this line. I've been struck by this line. Verse 20, he says, because what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Acts 17, 32, a little bit later, it says, when they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some began to ridicule him, but others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. I have a photo I'd love to throw up. If you want to go ahead and throw that up, Sam. Uh, Raphael was a, an artist in uh, the 1500s, and he was commissioned by the Pope at that time to create a couple of various cartoons based on uh, the book of Acts and based on Paul's interactions with the book of Acts. And so here is uh, Paul, here's uh, Raphael's interpretation of Paul in Athens at this moment in the Areopagus. A couple of reactions here that we see uh, in this photo that I'm just going to quickly run through and then we'll be done. Because I think these are the reactions I think we as people can um, expect. Uh, some people, when Paul gave this message, some people were critical and dismissive of the message. Uh, so you can look at that picture and you can kind of see people there like pointing at him. They're kind of discussing with one another. And, and there were just a group of people that were just like, no, we're not interested. And, and I just want to say as we're practicing attentive evangelism, can we just normalize rejection? Can we just normalize that? Like I think all Christians for a season in their life should be door-to-door -door salesmen. You know what I mean? We just should just be door to door salesman just for a period of our life, just so you like we get it. Or if you if you you know if you're a startup, what do you know? If you're doing a startup and you're raising funds, what do you know? You got ten no's. You're thinking what? That yes is right around the corner. If I got ten no's, yes is coming. You know? Can we just normalize rejection? Can we just recognize like and not everyone's going to align with me? Not everyone's going to say yes to you. Paul gave the most. You know, gave a, a nuanced, culturally balanced, culturally it's kind of savvy message, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and still people said no. So some were dismissive, uh, not interested in Jesus. Uh, some needed more time. Uh, you can kind of see this in the, the photo, right? They, these were the ones who were saying, hey, give us, we, we would love more. So these, these gentlemen in the photo, they're kind of locked in, right? And there are some people as we're sharing the gospel, they just need more space to think about it. And more time to kind of process through. Uh, Augustine said that um, salvation comes upon people in two ways. He says for some people it comes like the sudden flash of a light. And so it's like boom, immediately. They're like, oh, I need new life. I need Jesus. I need to say no to the old life immediately. And he says for other people salvation comes like the dawning of the day. Just the slow dawning of the day. And before you know it, they're like, oh, shoot, I think I'm a Christian. I don't know how that happens, but I, I, and so some people just need more time. Just patience with practicing patience. Only. And then thirdly, we see from the story, we see from the picture, some are immediately drawn in. I, I love this couple here on the, the bottom right. Hands raised, knees to the ground. Paul, I'm hearing what you're saying, I'm gonna receive it. I receive Jesus as Lord. I'm saying, I'm saying yes to him. I, I, I want him. I told you verse 20, um, where they said, this sounds strange. Can, can we just return? Can we? Like, is it possible to get Christianity back to a place of just strangeness? Can we just lay off the relevancy thing, the, the kind of desire to be hip and connected with culture? Like, can we just acknowledge that what we believe is strange? Like, if you read the Bible with any type of integrity, it is odd. Like, we believe donkeys can talk. We believe fire can come down from heaven. We believe in a virgin birth. We believe that the, the divine, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, came into the uh, incarnate, into the, the form of a baby. That is not normal, people. It's not normal. Can we get strangeness back? Like I think people are tired of the empty promises of modernity. I think they're tired of the empty promises of, of materialism that aren't filling it. I, I just think they're simply tired of it. And I think what they I think what they're looking for is something different. Is something unique. Okay. 
let's take a little bit of space this morning. Maybe you're here this morning, you just need to kind of process out this message. Maybe for you, um, you've just adopted a, a privatized type of faith. And so maybe this morning you just need to say to God, would you help me? I, um, I've kind of just kept my faith inside. And, and you know you have employees or you have um, co-workers, maybe friends, roommates, uh, doormates, classmates, um, peers who, who don't know Jesus and, and you've, just, you've just not said anything. Maybe this morning you just need to say to God, God, would you give me courage like Paul? Would you give me courage like Paul? Maybe you just need to say, God, would you give me a, a spirit of, of brokenness over the losses of the city? God, God, help me. All right, let's take about 30 seconds or so. Just kind of pray in your space. And then I'll invite us to stand.